Wills and probate are essential in genealogy research. When you're tracing your family history, you need to understand what kind of documents are out there to trace your family, particularly if you're trying to trace somebody that was born in the late 1700s or early 1800s. So for all the details on probate research, stay tuned. Hi, I'm Amy and I am talking today about probate records. You may have watched my video with Connie Knox from Genealogy TV where we talked about researching your ancestors that were born in the late 1700s, early 1800s, basically pre-1850 research because our census records in 1850 named all the residents in the household, but before that they didn't. And so sometimes people really get stumped when they're trying to find the parents of somebody that was born in the early 1800s or earlier. So. Today we're gonna to talk all about probate records. I've done another video about deed records and you would be wise to probably take a look at that one as well because there's a few things in that video that I'm not gonna cover again today because it's kind of repetitious. So let's get started. All right, so probates. First of all, they are more than wills. A lot of times we think of probate records as only wills and that's not true. So you wanna be sure that you're looking at all probate records. We're gonna to talk today about different types of probate records, what you can find, and where you can find them. All right, there's a few things that you need to understand about the law in order for you to understand wills and probate records. First of all, one of the big words in probate is intestate or testate. If you died with a will, it's a testate probate, meaning that you provided the information on what you wanted to have happen with your stuff. And if you, died without a will, it's considered intestate. And a lot of people think if there wasn't a will, there's no records, but that's not true. If somebody died intestate without a will, there's still a lot of things that can be found. So when the colonies were formed, the laws were based on English law because that's where basically most of the people came from. So there's a few things to understand about English law, common law, as it is oftentimes called, and how that affects our wills and probates. So in common law, a woman could not own property if she was married, her husband owned her property. And that sounds kind of harsh, which it was, but one of the things that happened though was that a woman had dower right, which meant that she was entitled if her husband passed away to one third of his estate until she died or remarried. So, and sometimes wills will like delineate that, but sometimes they don't. And so it's important to know that fact because a woman could have gone to the court and said, regardless of what the will said, I'm entitled to a third and it would affect the will. There were a number of states that were based more on French law, like Louisiana, and their laws are based on civil law, which is totally different when it pertains to women. So it does depend on what state you're in. Now on the other video that I did on deeds, I talk a little bit more about the differences between those two things, civil and common law, so you can go check that out. A couple of other things to remember is that if somebody was under the age of 21 and their father passed away, they required a guardian, even if their mother was alive. And again, this depends on the state and the time period, but they required a guardian. And frequently that guardian, if the mother was alive, might've been a relative of the mother. So if you have family members who were under the age of 21 when an ancestor died, you definitely wanna be looking for guardianship records. Also know that in a legal document, if they called somebody an infant, that could mean that they were under 14 years old. So when we think of the word infant nowadays, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were really an infant by our terms, right? So keep that in mind, that a, a child that is 10, 12, could be considered an infant in some of these legal documents. So don't let that throw you off. Now in a lot of wills, you're going to see somebody specify the name of a child and they give them a dollar. And that just seems kind of weird. But know that in England, that wasn't uncommon. They would mention all of their children and give them a dollar so that that way the will wasn't going to be contested and it was clear that nobody was forgotten. That one dollar did not necessarily mean that they were kind of punishing that child. Sometimes it might have meant that, because one of the other things to consider in English law was that um, the oldest son usually received the majority of the estate. And so a lot of times fathers would provide, like for a daughter that got married, upon her marriage they would provide her 
household items or land or some of their other children land. So sometimes if they gave somebody a dollar, it was to note that they hadn't forgotten that child, but maybe they provided a gift to that child prior to the, the date of this will. And that's another reason to go look in deeds because a lot of times that's where you'll see those kinds of gifts given within a deed record. It could have also meant that that person already had sufficient wealth and income. And so the father was deciding to, or, or it can be in women's cases as well, decided to give something to other children that maybe were more in need. One of the other things that you wanna pay attention to are the witnesses of any of these documents. The witnesses frequently, particularly of the will, the witnesses were frequently neighbors because they asked somebody who lived nearby to come and witness a will. So when you're looking at that fan club, the friends, associates, and neighbors, you're, you wanna be paying attention to those witness names because they can give you a lot of information if you're not finding success in these deeds and probate records. The fan club can be extremely important. A couple of really important facts that you can obtain from a will are the date that the will was written versus the date that the will was submitted to the court. And that gives you the window of time of somebody's death if you have no other death record. And usually they died pretty close to the date that the will was submitted to the court. So that can provide great information when there's no headstone or no other death record, which when we're looking at this time period, frequently you're not going to find a death record. The other thing that's really helpful is wills very frequently provide the married names of daughters. And sometimes that is the only record that we have of one of the daughter's marriages. I'd like to dive in and show you a couple of records and illustrate some of the things that I've just been talking about. So the first document that I have for you is a will and it illustrates a lot of really great things that we just talked about. This is the will of John Fry. It was filed in Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania. This will says at the time that he wrote it, he was in perfect health of body and sound mind. And it was written, let's see, we'll look at the bottom of the will. The will was written on the 9th of January, 1809. But it was filed in the court on the 16th of September, 1819. So 10 years later, basically this will was filed. So he probably died probably in 1819. So let's look at this will. In the will, there's a lot of times there's some pretty common language in a will, and I'm gonna skip over a lot of that. I just wanna point out a couple of things for you. He asked that a convenient time after his decease, his personal property be sold and be distributed as follows. He said, his dear wife, Anna Marie, shall have one third part of the whole amount of net proceeds. That is an illustration of, of dowry. And then he notes, the children of my first wife are to have one dollar. Now again, he's mentioning each of them, but this will also gave us a clue then, right? So Anna Marie, his wife, is not his first wife, and this will will tell me which children were from his first wife and which children were from Anna Marie. So he mentions all of his children by his first wife, his son John, his son Conrad, the children of his deceased daughter Susanna, who intermarried with Henry Hoffert. So wow, a lot of information there. So we know he had a daughter, she married Henry Hoffert, and she was, had died before 1809 when this will was written. His son Philip, his daughter Magdalena, who intermarried with George Knopf. His son Jacob, his daughter Catherine, who intermarried with James Cogley. His son Frederick, his son Michael. And then he mentions to the children of his present wife, Anna Maria, she'll have as follows to his son George, in addition to what he has gotten from him already. So again, clue, I wanna be maybe looking in deeds to find out more of that information, the sum of $74. To his son Peter, the sum of $27.33, it looks like that was kind of, that page was kind of ripped off. To his son Henry, the sum of $27.33. To his son Andrew, in addition to what he has already gotten from me already, the sum of $17.33. To his daughter Salome, who intermarried with George Formeyer, the sum of $17.33. And then he goes on and talks more about the items that he wants Anna Marie to have. And he kind of delineates those. He notes that his plantation should be sold to its best advantage. So again, I have a clue. I wanna be looking in deeds for this plantation. And then he goes on to talk about which children are to receive the proceeds of that plantation. This will was witnessed by Simon Drum and Jacob Rieger and William Fried. So those are people that I would want to be looking at. 
So that's the end of this will. Now, are there more probate records for Jacob Fry? Undoubtedly, and those would be things that we'd want to look for. Now here's a letter of administration. The widow, Catherine Hoffman, was made the executor. This noted that he left no last will and testament. But again, we have an executor paper that named his wife. And we did if we didn't know his wife already, here we have it. So this is an example of somebody not having a will, but we still find a document that's very helpful in finding out more about his family. Now I want to show you one other thing. I had a I think it's a third great grandmother, I'm not sure, I'd have to look it up again, who died in San Francisco before the Great Fire of San Francisco. And as a result, her will is, is no longer available. It was destroyed in the fire. And so you would think there's nothing out there. But I actually found a newspaper article that talked about her will, and it's pretty funny. The mother's will gives advice, and it talks about um, her fact that she urged careful living. Having given my to my son, Andre Dumont, his share of my estate, I entreat him with the entreaties born of a mother's love to forsake the use of intoxicating drinks and live a sober and industrious life. And lastly, I recommend to my dear children to gauge always their expenditures by their income so as never to cause losses to others or bring upon themselves suffering and want. And this talks about that she died a few days ago. So having the newspaper, I then know when she died if I don't have any other record of that. She, she does have a headstone, so I did know that through that. And then it talks about the names of her children. If I didn't have that information, that's provided in this newspaper article. So there's lots of different places to search. A newspaper article isn't necessarily the most common place to search for the details of a will. Estates were required to put a notice in a newspaper of somebody's passing so that if anybody had any claims on the estate, that could happen before the estate was closed, just like today. So newspapers are something you want to be looking at when you're looking for documents for a probate. Not only will it tell you the timing of the probate, but it can provide other information. And who knows what you'll find? You might find a great article like I found for my third great grandmother. So let's talk about where do you find these records? These records can be found usually on the county level. They're held in their county courthouse, and if you contact them, they can tell you whether they still have them or whether they were sent to a state archives or another repository. So you're gonna be looking at the county level for these records. Occasionally, like in New York, sometimes they would hold some of these records on a township level, but most of the time, you're gonna find them on the county level. And you can go into the county courthouses and you can look at your documents. You can sometimes contact them and order them from them, but there's a lot online. And I'm gonna spend some time talking about what you can find online. In the video that I just did on deed research, I talked about the fact that Ancestry has quite a lot of these land records and some of their records are actually referencing documents that are in microfilm at FamilySearch. And I kind of talked about how I prefer FamilySearch when I'm looking at deeds because, I, I don't know, I just can find them better. But on wills and probate records, sometimes the opposite is true. Sometimes I find them easier on Ancestry. But I do always want to go over to Family Search and make sure I'm not missing a record set. Because Ancestry might have some of the records, but I may not always be able to find all of the probate records. So let me show you Ancestry really quick and then we're gonna move over to Family Search. So here is Ancestry, and here is, and I'm gonna put a link to this exact record set or database, I can't think of what I'm looking for, um, into the show notes at the bottom, underneath, into the description. So, um, but this is will, probate, land, tax, and criminal records. So there's lots of things in here. You can search by last name and first name. Sometimes less is more, and sometimes just last name. If I know where I'm looking, I'll put that in first just to see what I'm finding. Usually what I just put in is a last name, like Cross, and I'll put in a lived in place and I'll put in, um, let's say Dade County, Florida. And so it pops up right here, but I wanna keep it exact to that county if I know for sure that they were in that county or county and adjacent counties. Those are the two search terms that I use the most often. And then I'll just click search. And, um, and then I can look through the records. Sometimes wills are showing up now in hints on Ancestry as well. The one thing that I would tell you though is to make sure that you look at all of the records surrounding it because a lot of times on Ancestry, we tend to just 
look for one particular thing. So here is a record of one that I just kind of came across on Ancestry of Richard Ivy Smith, which is kind of unusual because his residence is in Dade, Dade County, Florida, but his probate place was Rockingham County, North Carolina. This is in 1952. So he probably was going down to Florida for the summers or for the winters. So um, let's look at this will really quick. And I wanna show you a couple of things. One, when I pull up this will, I'm seeing one page here and a lot of people don't always recognize all of the pages before and after. So as I'm looking, and I'm gonna get rid of this little directory thing right here, but as I'm looking at this will, I wanna point out that you can move right here, right and left, and look at all of the various pages of this will, as well as some of the other information. Like here is the petition for the probate of the will that was then filed. The will was first and then the probate of the will was after. So there's a lot of information that can be found in, this, in these places. It's not just a will, there's a lot of other records in here. So make sure that you look around and, and see all of the records. You can look around this like you're flipping through the pages of a book. So Ancestry is a good resource. But I do recommend that you also check Family Search because Family Search may have some things in it that you're not going to find on Ancestry. So let's go over to Family Search. And here I'm in Florida, Dade County, and I wanted to show you some of the different records that are on, on probate. Let me backtrack here though, and let me show you how I got there. If you go on to Family Search, and you, and I'm not even gonna sign in, you don't even need to for this part, but I'm gonna go to search and I'm gonna go to catalog, and I'm gonna go kind of large to small. So I'm gonna go Florida and I'm gonna go Dade. And then I've got that right here, search, and then I'm coming up with all of the records held for Dade County, Florida that they have on Family Search. And right here we've got probate records. And look at, we have four different kinds of records, not just wills. We have a register of wills, but we have a probate minute book, we have letters of testament, testamentary and administration, and then we have estate files with an index. So these could all be valuable things. So I, if I look at these letters of testamentary and administration, these are records that may have been filed for somebody that died in testate, meaning without a will, like we talked about before. So this would be something, if I don't find a will, I wanna be checking this out. Now let me show you down here. If you see a little key over the camera, that means that that microfilm has to be read at a family history library. And if you click on it, if I see the camera with the key, it's one of two things. Like I mentioned before, I wasn't signed in, and that's the case here. So if I click on this right now, it's going to tell me that I need to sign in. But if the other reason may be that due to the re restrictions for the original microfilming of the record, they may not be able to show it to the public at large. And if that's the case, then when you click on it, there's gonna be a pop-up window that's gonna say, this document has to be viewed at a family history library or an affiliate library. I'd like to point out that this is microfilm 187045, but it's items two and three. So if I click on that, if I were to look at the first item, this is marriage records. This isn't what I wanted. So I'm gonna go back out further and I'm going to look for the um, item two or three. Here's item two. And if I look at this book, this is the record of letters of testamentary and administration. Perfect, that's what I wanted. So at the beginning of this book, I have a little index. Voila, that's awesome. So let's go back to these estate files. So I'm gonna click on this. And this is showing me an index right here to the different estate files. So if I click on this, I can look through this index and I can find whoever I'm looking for and see if they have an estate file in that county. Let me show you another example. Here we have Lawrence, Kentucky, Lawrence County, Kentucky. And here we have records for inventories, appraisements, guardian bonds, and administrator bonds. Sometimes you'll see guardianships up here and it's alphabetical, so it would be under genealogy, like right here. Sometimes guardian records are, are found within the probate records. So you wanna look in both places if you're looking for guardianship records. So this is all in one place. So if I go to this document, or this file, it's going to start here with just loose pages. So there's no index to these records, which makes things really difficult. 
And this shows an appraisement of a person's estate. They had one wash kettle um, and, and things like that. And I'll talk about who bought all of the different things that they appraised and for how much. And these are names that you want to be looking at because these are either neighbors or their family members. And so you want to be paying attention to the names of people that purchase stuff in an estate. So that can be very, very helpful. Let me go to one more. Here we have New York, New York. They have a ton of probate records. They have 32 different probate things. Some of these are books that people have written and you can click on them and take a look at them. Some of them are the court records, the decrees on accounting, administrator bonds, estate orders, index of wills, inventories, letters of petitions and administrations, letters of collections, letters testamentary, miscellaneous orders, miscellaneous probate records, orders admitting wills, orders granting and denying petitions, petitions and accounts, probate proceedings. There are a ton of different records here. So make sure you check out your probate records because they can be extremely helpful. I wish you luck as you dive into probate records and try to find those documents that can help you determine the parents or other information that you're looking for on your ancestors. If this has been of help to you, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks.